This is the introduction to the phylum Arthropoda, one of, uh, well, it is the biggest phylum by far, and I've talked about that including on the very first day of class. I want to make an important announcement, and that is we're switching the schedule. Uh, what we had planned for the 15th of February is to do an outdoor activity, and I'm going to push that back by one week. That's the most we can because I hope that we have better weather. So this is the lab for the 15th of February, and on the 22nd of February, we hope we can do another exercise. All right, so this, the introduction to one really big, important phylum. It is very diverse. So first of all, I don't want you to think of just insects when you think of arthropods. So right on the screen is one of the most annoying and pesky kinds of arthropods that of course carries disease and right away you can count that it has eight legs and these are ticks. Black widow spiders are, uh, we are right at the northern edge of the range, probably expected to go further north as temperatures warm in our climate. I had heard that they were known as far north uh, or just south of us of Beaver Dam, Beaver Dam State Park which is about Oh, seven or eight miles south of here. But when I moved into my home at the very southern edge of Carlinville in 1995, um, a basement window had kind of been opened. And when I came in the house, I could see exactly all of this. I could see a black widow with this nice red hourglass on its belly. And although most of the time I try to preserve life and respect life, I was not happy with having a black widow near living anywhere, uh, even at the edges of my home. So uh, I didn't preserve that specimen. Um, that animal's no longer with us. <clears throat> these are dust mites. Might recognize these as June bugs. Millipedes. This is a type of a crab, kind of fuzzy looking. Lives in the ocean. Scorpions. Notice that nothing on the screen Oh, only one on the screen is an insect over here on the right. This, now, some perhaps, um, well, s some more diversity, but more insects here. What we're seeing is five images of insects over here to the termite, to the butterfly, to the dragonfly, to the housefly. And then some more unusual arthropods like horseshoe crabs, and down here again, a shrimp. Arthropods rule. Within the field of zoology, I'm going to give you a lot of numbers that follow, and you should know that you should think of a number as more of a, a rounded estimate right now. It's kind of surprising, but it's, it's difficult to turn to any authoritative place right now to give you an updated number of all of the types of species of insects or arthropods in general or even all the other different invertebrate groups. Vertebrates we do a better job of keeping track of the species so we can give you that number a little more reliably. So I've gone through and tried to update some of this in some places of authoritative places I found even higher numbers. Um, so I've kind of averaged between what you're reading in your textbook and some resources that I've found and this is as of 2022. Your textbook notes 1.3 million species of animals. I've, I've found a resource that's reliable that said 1.7 are known, 1,700,000 1, are known of all animal species. So that number may be quite out of date in the Campbell book. Nonetheless, it's a very high number. and We're going to try to look at proportions here and less absolute numbers. Of that 1.3 million, clearly the majority are arthropods, <clears throat> about 90%, and 90% in fact are arthropods, but we're going to go with 80%, just to have a bit more of a conservative number. So you might ask this question, why aren't we spending more time on arthropods, Dr. Zilska? And I would say, good question, I'm glad you asked. See, that's funny because this is a recording and nobody else is listening but Lucy and she's sleeping or trying to sleep if I'd be quiet so she could sleep. 
So, I'm sorry, this isn't the way we've organized the class. We did not organize the class to spend a proportional amount of time on each of the animal groups. If that were the case, then about 85% of our laboratory time would be spent on studying arthropods. And that would be a really good and important exercise. And in fact, if you take a full year of zoology, often they divide it up into invertebrate zoology in one semester and vertebrate zoology in the other. That still is not representative, of course. That's only 50% for all invertebrates. So it gives 5% of the animals, vertebrates, 50% of that time. And that's what I experienced in my zoology major when I was an undergrad. So sadly, arthropods just get one week. <clears throat> By the way, do you want to learn more about animal diversity? Do you want to go to one of these really good websites? Uh, there are a few. Um, by the way, other than this one on the screen, which all you have to remember to do is to search ADW for Animal Diversity Web, and you'll get to this University of Michigan website where there's all sorts of information about animals, and you can look up individual species and learn more, as it says, about their natural history, so where they live, what they eat, the kind of shelter, locations, their activities, where we find them, the distribution, how we classify an organism today and how it's related to other organisms. And of course, if there's issues of conservation, um, so if the, the species is in short supply and it used to be in much more abundant, we might have conservation measures in place and of course protections like the Endangered Species Act. <clears throat> so textbook says about 1.3 million. I think it's fair to say 1.1 million are arthropods. Um, so you're looking at 85 to 90 percent of all species are arthropods. This is, of course, what we know of species on Earth. I was going through looking at web references and finding good scientists trying to estimate. Of the 1.3 million species, they're trying to estimate how many are really out there. So how close have we come? And the answer is probably there are six times as many species in the real world than we know about. So the answer is close to 8 million species are currently estimated to be in the wild, of which we only have described about 1.3, in other estimates 1.7. So the point is, is that we have many times more species waiting to be described, and so good, good time to be a zoologist, guys. If you want to describe species and name them after uh, maybe important people in your life or important people in the field. Um, hey, I'll just mention something on the side. Here's an idea that's actually happening in zoology. Because when you study an uh, unusual species that, for the most part, it's not all that significant to our society and most people don't care about it. Um, so it could be a, a new tick species, for example. Um, or it's a new fly species or something. And if you want to do research on that species, well, guys, there isn't money. There is not money available uh, to study these kinds of things. Uh, certainly not much money available. So here's something that people are doing. They're creating an auction <clears throat> for the highest bidder to have the species named after that person. So you could have a species named after you if you give a large amount of money, and then that money is used to study the species. So you can think about that. Is that something that, that is a good idea? Is that something that we would support doing? I think it's interesting. Well, about 85% of all known species are arthropods. About 90% of arthropods are insects. Wow. So let's, let's look, this, uh, look at this as a kind of a, a diagram here with subsets, about 1.3 million animals known, of which about 1.1 million are arthropods, our topic today. Of the arthropods, we're saying about 950,000 are insects. <clears throat> so 950,000 divided by uh, 1.3 million comes up to be 73, so about three quarters 
of all known species of animals are insects. <clears throat> so I went to the Royal Entomological Society and they actually said there's about a million species. I used 950,000. So most arthropods by far are insects. Lots of species of insects. Very, very high numbers. And that means we have a very proud and happy insect. Within the insects, now let's look at diversity within the insects. And again, these numbers vary depending on where you're at. So I'm going to say 35 to 40 percent of all insects, of all insects, are just one particular type of insect. And we'll see if you remember, because we covered this on the first day of class. What type of insect is it? Well, is it butterflies and moths? Nope. These are Lepidoptera. You do have to know these orders. I'm giving you some basic orders, not all the insect orders. The big ones. <clears throat> this is about 14% of all insects. So it's a big one, but not 40, not 35 to 40. How about uh, stinging insects and, and ants? Things that are included. Ants, bees, and wasps. Well, this is the Hymenoptera. And they're only about 14% of all insects. So the group we're looking for is close to three times as abundant as number of species. Sorry, as number of species. How about flies? Flies, by the way, have two wings, not four, typical of insects. And flies are in the order Diptera. Okay. And that's about 18%. So we're looking at something that's about twice flies. <clears throat> What's left? See if you can guess, and I'll give you a hint. So if you know your really old music, or music when I was a kid, these are the Beatles. And the answer is Beatles. Back to that slide. So just look at ladybug diversity over here. The very outer pair of wings of Beatles is this hard kind of shell. They're called the elytra. And they aren't flying wings. So if you watch the ladybird take off, she flips up, or he flips up, the outer elytra, and then reveals underneath some very flexible wings for flight. Now we're talking in class about evolution. And I'm going to mention to you that the important work of Wallace and Darwin are ones that gave us the idea of natural selection. And the idea by both, Dar the idea, the same idea by Darwin and Wallace were independently derived and within, you know, relatively uh, close period of time. Darwin came up with it in the 1830s and, and Wallace came up with it in the late 1850s, so about 20 years apart. Their ideas were presented together on the same day. July 1st of 1858. And Wallace was traveling around in the South Pacific. And he was a person who would have gone to Blackburn. He didn't have any money. And he was collecting up unusual insects or other critters and sending them back to mostly Europe to be sold. And that's how he supported himself. And in his travels, Wallace noted a lot of diversity. And he noticed patterns of the diversity. Oh my goodness, is that important? So this is actually a picture from one of his books about the kind of beetles that he was finding. Okay, let's talk about the traits. And this references that great big table comparing all the different animal phyla. So maybe you want to pause right here while you go get that table. I'm going to see if you can remember and you can tell me. So what type of symmetry? Would we say it's radial or bilateral? So is there a single line that creates mirror images? Or are there many lines that create mirror images? So you can take a pie, like an apple pie, and you can cut across the middle and create a mirror image in many different ways. Right? 
So the first cut of an apple pie, there's no one place you usually cut it. But if you wanted to cut mirror images of, let's say, a rat, which is something you'll be dissecting here in zoology, there's only one place, just like on you, between your nostrils, down your belly button, through the anus, just along with that butt crack that we have, it's going to split you into, into just one mirrored image section, and that's bilateral symmetry. So these guys clearly show bilateral symmetry. Everything from this point on has these three embryonic layers, and I hope you can name them from outside to inside. <clears throat> They're the common layers. We've been looking at it. Those common layers are found in all animal groups that we're looking at after platyhelmin or after cnidarians. Platyhelminthes have these three. And the outer is ectoderm, the middle mesoderm for middle, and endoderm is the innermost. Well, insects, do they poop out one end and take food in the other? Yes, they do. Millipedes just as well, just like earthworms. Do they have a sea long? Yes, they do. So, so far, what we've just looked at here, what is different between annelids and arthropods? <clears throat> and the answer is nothing on the screen. Annelids show bilateral symmetry, so do arthropods. Annelids have the three germ layers. Annelids have a, an anus separate from a mouth. And annelids have a coelom just like, just like arthropods do. Now the coelom and, and its relationship to the circulatory system is different. And arthropods do something that's different than earthworms do and different than we do. In our circulatory system, which is like what's in the upper right on this fish, the blood stays in the blood vessels and the heart. Now, some blood does kind of leak out a little bit. Fluids certainly do, so the plasma of the blood is going to leak out. But in general, the circ system contains the blood. That's the arteries, the veins, all the little guys, the arterioles, and the venules, and the capillaries, as well as the heart. That's a closed circulatory system. That's what we have. That's what earthworms have. But arthropods have what's called an open circulatory system. And in their circulatory system, um, blood's coming into the heart and then being pumped out, and then the blood leaves the arterial system and enters into the coelom. So the coelom is one big common space where the blood enters. And blood should not be uh, entering into your coelom beyond simple little mistakes that might happen in the body. So on the left, we have arthropods with an open circulatory system, and on the right, closed. Here's a figure from a different part of your book. This particular part of the book is, as you can see, uh, chapter 42. Chapter 42 is devoted to the circulatory system. Here, just another figure that I got off the internet showing you again <clears throat> that we have these osteo where blood is returning to the heart and then it's being pumped out into the coelom. So it's an open circulatory system in arthropods. <clears throat> what about segmentation? Did we see segmentation in in annelids? Yeah, we did. Certainly. Do we see segmentation in arthropods? Yeah, we do. Yeah. Very much so. Now I want to talk a little bit about arthropod body plans. And I'm sure this is presented somewhere else, but honestly, I, I don't remember seeing it. So let me explain this to you. <clears throat> Think of the basic components of an arthropod body. Could be a spider, could be a millipede, could be a scorpion, could be a bee. Okay. And think of the basic components as the head, thorax, and abdomen. <clears throat> the head is going to have a lot of sensory structures on it. Good to write this down. So antennae, for example, mouth parts, eyes, 
lots of things that are interacting in the world, much like your head. Thorax is where the legs are probably going to be attached, but we'll see an exception. And the abdomen is usually the terminal, the last or most caudal region of the body, that probably doesn't have legs attached. We'll see an exception. So we got head, thorax, and abdomen from left to right on the length of the organism. Insects have a separate head, thorax, and abdomen. So here's the head. Here's the thorax with the three pairs of legs attached. And here's the abdomen down here without legs attached. By the way, the thorax also has wings attached if there are wings. But in some cases, the head and thorax are fused together into one unit called the cephalothorax. Ceph, as a word root, means head. So this just means head thorax. And there are two general parts of the body when there's a cephalothorax, the other part being the abdomen. And this would be a good example with spiders. Now, another version of fusion occurs where the head is kept separate, but the thorax and abdomen are combined. So here we combined head and thorax. Here we're combining thorax and abdomen. And that becomes what's known as a trunk. And what gives what, what has this kind of, of body pattern? Here's a centipede over here with that kind of fusion, okay, or millipedes. <clears throat> there are other arthropod groups here we could be including. Cephalothorax is also seen in crayfish. So here we're looking at some of the diversity of arthropods. Here we've got a cephalothorax. Here we've got a head and a trunk. Here we have the three body parts. Over here we have cephalothorax again, so notice the legs are attaching to the anterior segment that includes the head and a separate abdomen. Here is the one exception where technically what used to be the abdomen bears legs. So when you have a trunk, the trunk might have legs all along its length. Other parts of interest. First of all, if you're handling a tarantula or other, other spiders, uh, you worry about getting bit because you should essentially assume that all spiders are poisonous. Well, all spiders are venomous, is what I should say. They use a, a special chemical that they produce, and they inject it into their prey by chelicery. And if it's a true venom system, that's being used to disable the prey. Whether or not it hurts you and I, well, probably most spider bites you're going to have some reaction, although it may, might just be a tiny little red dot, and probably paired. Um, there are relatively few spiders that are of great concern for human health. Brown recluse and black widow are both found in our county, so they are worth our attention. Here on a tarantula, the chelicerae are fairly big, and in this case, if you get bit by a tarantula, it's actually just going to be really painful to have these things jabbing into your body. <clears throat> so the part that's injecting venom, or the chelicerae, the parts of a spider that are exploring its environment, that's feeling and, and sensing what's going on, those are called the pedipalps. Pedi means feet, palp is to feel. So they are the feeling feet. Spiders have many sets of eyes, <clears throat> and they have distinct patterns, and that's part of identifying what species of spider you have. You might have felt like there were teachers who had eyes in the back of their head. Well, spiders actually do. Here's a pair of eyes back here in the back corner. So it's hard to creep up on a spider. Some more spider eyes here. So some located in the back that are able to see behind them as well as in front of them. Here's the one uh, spider that I am most concerned about. These are pretty abundant within the science complex. Um, I just found one over Christmas break in the old lab, um, the alumni labs, uh, a very big one. There's one that with, with its legs spread out would be even bigger than a quarter. 
and I'm not happy about that. Uh, these guys sh should not be around. We should be able to control them, but I have found them in our Mahan faculty offices. Um, I leave out glue traps and I leave them out and I can sample what's crawling around. And so I have glue traps that have brown recluse on them. There's no question. And that's how I know, because I actually have the specimens, because I collected them in both the alumni and in Mayhem. On the cephalothorax, you see something right here that some people have described as looking like a violin or a fiddle. So it's got this base with constrictions, and it's got this long, thin line. This is about the color of brown recluse spiders uh, that we have. And so they're lighter in color, and they have these long, spindly legs that are not apparently very hairy. The bite of a brown recluse is interesting. There's it's still a, a bit of a, of a controversy, um, but it certainly can be very painful, and it can be what's said to be necrotic. So necro, as a word, it means death. Necrosis is where a part of your body is dying, and the injection from these spiders seems to cause the area that's injected to die. And it's possible, if you got a really bad bite, that an area between the size of a grape and the size of maybe even a golf ball could die in a part of your body. And that's going to leave a heck of a scar after it eventually heals, after many, many, many months. And you have to be careful about infections. And so when that heals up, a heck of a scar, and you wouldn't want that on your face or anything else. Brown recluse are reclusive. They, they don't like to be out and about. They might move a little bit at night, and that's where I find them, in, and we've seen them in the faculty offices. Um, but generally, you're not going to encounter them, got to listen up, until you're moving things that have largely been stored and not been bothered in a while. So, if in the fall you open up a box that's got sweaters in it, and that box has been stored in an attic or a basement, it's quite possible that brown recluse are living in that box with your spiders. When you put away winter clothes right now in the spring, think about putting them in a closed container. So if you're going to put sweaters and things in a box, put those sweaters and things in a plastic garbage bag, tie the garbage bag so that nothing can enter, and then you can put the garbage bag in the box knowing that in the fall when you pull out the bag you want to make sure there aren't spiders between the bag and the box but within the bag you can be pretty safe so i've done that in my office i have some zipped up containers where i'm storing some things so i'm pretty sure that the spiders aren't getting in sometimes moving things in a garage so sometimes throughout the summer people might have boards stacked up in their garage or other things and they're moving them apart and they put their hand in to grab the board and that's when they disturb the spider and they can get bit. These are not spiders that are expected to chase you down in any way. These are spiders where you disturb their quiet little place and there's problems. And what I'm talking about right now is, is often the information we cover in the lab, but I'm doing it right now because you've got the recording and you can go back and take some notes. <clears throat> so these animals normally stay put. And when we go and disturb things, I am always on the lookout. This is a very serious animal. I do not want to be bit by brown recluses. Okay? Now, because they stay put so often, and because of the nature of arthropod skeletons, which is that they have an exoskeleton, and they have to molt to grow. They have to cast off the outer layers of their skeleton so they can pump themselves up and get bigger and then form a new, harder, firmer skeleton. But that means there's molts left behind. That is a skeleton that looks like a spider, but it's not the spider, it's the, just the shed skeleton. And in brown recluse, frequently they stay put so often that when you find a brown recluse, you might think you found several of them until you look closely and you realize it's one live spider and a series of shed exoskeletons. I haven't seen that, but um, I'm told that that's pretty common. When I found them, that's not the case. <clears throat> well, where do we typically find brown recluse? And you can see we are well within the range. There are other related species equally of concern more in the southwestern United States. Now, if you look at this map and you think, oh good, I'm going to be safe if I live all in these other places, um, I want to warn you. 
People move about our country a lot. And when they move, they take boxes that have been in storage and they take them from our home here and they take them in another state and then they open up their boxes. I think it's safe to assume that most homes in the United States, homes and apartments, unless they've just been built and whoever moved in didn't move in any boxes or old clothing or anything packaged up, and I think that's pretty rare, I think you can assume that most homes in the United States have brown recluses in them because people have been moving around and moving things around. So I, I wouldn't feel safe living anywhere in the United States where you don't think brown recluses are found. This is mostly where you find them outside. I'm talking about inside our homes. Black widows, uh, again, uh, black widows are found within our area. You can see this on the range map right here, including where we live, which is about right there. And so we could expect to find black widows. They make a, a big stringy spider web. And as you're going through the woods, you got to be careful you don't walk through a spider web with a spider on it. Because if you think this through, guys, you're walking through the woods, you aren't watching, paying attention, spider web gets on you. That spider's on the spider web, and now that spider is on you. Maybe the spider falls off or brushes off, or maybe you move some clothing and the spider's underneath the clothing and you get bit. So one little trick some of us use as we go through the woods when there's suspected spider webs is we get a, a stick, maybe a three or four foot stick, and we wave it in front of us as we go through the woods to try to knock down spider webs before we pass through them. Black Widow's other thing to tell you is that, um, and something, I don't know, never mentioned, I guess, when you take animals like this and you preserve them, and we preserve them and hold them in alcohol, the alcohol dissolves the color. So if you were to look at our preserved Black Widow's, they don't have a red hourglass here. It's white, and it used to be red, but the alcohol has removed the red color from the animal. We're going to go through and dissect some crayfish, look at some basic parts. We aren't going to do uh, crazy details on the inside, but uh, good enough. And here you see an animal with a cephalothorax, and that's got the legs then attached to a segment that includes the head, and a very clear abdomen down here. Okay. We're going to pull up this part of the cephalothorax, and directly underneath, it's got an open edge here, so you could stick a finger underneath there are gills. So water is flushed up past the gills. The top of the gills are protected by the cephalothorax. That cephalothorax, that area, is called the carapace. So the carapace is this big shield that I was talking about lifting up. And the carapace then is part of the cephalothorax. In between the eyes, there's an extension of the cephalothorax. And, and the area uh, around our nose is rostral. Rostral means nose. And so it's the little nose plate. The claws are kelepeds. I know we could call them claws, but they're called kelepeds. And so if you go to Red Lobster and you're going to eat some lobster, what are you eating? You're eating kelepeds and abdomens. Now we're going to learn why it is that when you have lobster, the tails are always split and it's always on the dorsal side. I'm curious if any of you know why that is. Looks like the lobster just burst, right? Well, the answer is there's an intestine running right down the length, right near the surface here. It's the same as shrimp. Shrimp are usually split as well down the back of the, the dorsal side of the abdomen. And jets of water may wash out the intestine and the feces that are there. And the anus is on the underside of the tail. So we'll explore that when we look at crayfish. But these are split open because they were removing that intestine. Okay? So you don't have to eat the lobster poop. <clears throat> so what is red lobster? Well, it's the house of decapods. And decapods is the name of the group that includes crayfish and lobsters. And deca... As a word root means, well, what is a decade? That's 10 years. So 10, and then pods or feet. So the name tells you what they are. 
Here looking at the underside, uh, we can start sexing males and females. Clearly these females have eggs, so that's easy to identify for us. There's a genital pore here. And what we're going to look at is look at um, little legs, or not legs really, appendages here called swimmerettes. And I'll show you in the next slide. If you look at a swimmer at the first swimmerettes right here on a male, they're very, very long. And in females, they're smaller. And so those very, very long swimmerettes here are for males to transfer sperm to the females. So in the back picture, you can see there aren't much in the way of swimmerettes here. And in the male, there clearly are. So if you go to Red Lobster and you get a lobster, you can tell if it's a male or a female. Here we've removed the carapace portion of the cephalothorax. Here's the eyes, and the calipeds, and the abdomen. And here's those gills that I was telling you about that are right underneath the carapace. These feathery gills, if you fan them out. <clears throat> the heart is a, a sac-like structure. It's an open circulatory system. It's along the back, and you probably won't really be able to recognize what it is. I just want you to know the region of the heart. We'll do a little bit more anatomy of crayfish, as you'll see on the Tenoshi. Here we got a millipede and a centipede. Centipede on the bottom right here, and a millipede on the top. Which of these two is probably okay to pick up if you find them in the woods? I really want you to know this answer. Well, millipedes are herbivores, centipedes are carnivores. Centipedes have little poison venom structures at the very, very front that are, are going to inject a venom in you if the animal's in that kind of posture, if it's being defensive. And so these guys are typically venomous. Uh, millipedes do have a defense mechanism. They may give off um, cyanide gas but it's not really enough to affect you. I guess if you put a whole bunch of millipedes in one jar and they're alive and then you really irritated them and then you opened up the lid of the jar and breathed deeply, you probably could get cyanide poisoning. And if you're doing that, you really have to wonder about what's, what's wrong. Okay, so these are very friendly guys and, and be nice to them. And we'll talk about these in, uh, on Tuesday's lab on the 15th. All right, so that largely ends what we're talking about. I want to I say to you, though, that now that we've been through enough phyllus, we've been through periphera, sponges, cnidaria, the jellies and sea anemones, been through platyomenthes, the flat worms, which included tapeworms and flukes and planarians, annelids, so we looked at annelids, which included leeches and some polychaetes in the ocean and also earthworms, and now we're looking at arthropods. From this point on, at the very end, very end of your quiz, when I show you images, usually five, I'm going to follow with two additional images, and you have to figure out what phylum the animals belong to. So, it would be something like this. At the very end of next week's quiz, you can earn extra credit. And I might show you this and say, okay, what is the phylum? And now you have to write down and spell correctly the phylum. And the phylum here is platyhelminthes. Okay. So we're done. We're done talking about arthropods. And I will see you in lab on the 15th. We will also have a lecture, and it'll be a, a Google Meet lecture next Tuesday the 15th.